The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Aris Rosaikis. I'm the chair of the Division of Engineering and Applied Science here at Caltech. And I would like to welcome you all to the Ernest C. Watson lecture this evening. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to say a few words about the next event. Uh, our next speaker is also from the Division of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, his name is Jose Andrade. Uh, he is an associate professor of civil and mechanical engineering. His topic is seeing the world in a grain of sand. I hope to see you uh, here again in a few weeks. Now, it's a great privilege and a fantastic pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Guru Swami Naidu Ravichandran, the John E. Uh, Goody Jr professor of aerospace and professor of mechanical engineering, and the sixth director of the famous graduate aerospace laboratories, Galsit. Ravi received his Bachelor of Engineering degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Madras before moving to Brown University, where he obtained two master's degrees in engineering, one in solid mechanics and structures, and the other in applied mathematics, as well as a PhD degree in solid mechanics and structures with minors in material science and applied mathematics. Ravi and I met at Brown many, many years ago, and we were graduate students together. I'm a bit older than him. But we have remained very, very close friends through the years, and we have been colleagues for approximately 25 years now. <clears throat> now, as the title of his lecture today clearly says, he has always been a man of great impact. And you are going to experience that. This is only one measure um, of, well, actually, uh, only one measure of which is the number of honors and awards he has received. The list is very long, and I'm going to skip a lot of them but I cannot resist the temptation of telling you of some. So very recently, he was recognized for his seminal scientific contributions with an honorary degree from the Paul Verlaine University in Metz, France, and he has been recognized by his alma mater, uh, which awarded him a Distinguished Alumnus Award for Academic Excellence. <clears throat> He has been acting, active with many societies, including the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME, a society that has recently honored him with its fellow grade and bestowed on him the Charles Russ Richards Memorial Award. The Society of Experimental Mechanics, SCM, a society that has recently awarded him both the Lausanne and the Hetany Awards. He has held distinguished visiting professorships um, around the globe, uh, including one at the Ecole Polytechnique in France and at the Indian Institute of Sciences in Bangalore and the Tokyo Institute of Technology. His visibility in international academic and research communities is indeed spectacular. Now, last year, Ravi was elected to receive the Chevalier de l'Ordre uh, de Palme Académique from the French Republic. In other words, he was knighted by France. While this year he was elected fellow of the American Academy of Mechanics and was also inducted to the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. Now, Ravi's strengths as a researcher derive from his unique capability of brilliantly combining notions of solid mechanics with concepts of material science in a very meaningful and highly effective way. His experiments are simple, they are elegant, 
and are always designed to isolate and resolve the most basic scientific issues that lie in the elusive area of mesomechanics, of deformation and failure, and to eventually provide bridges between basic science and the pressing needs of society. To do this effectively, he employs a, formid a formidable theoretical background in analytical mechanics and an equally impressive breadth of knowledge in material science. His research work at Brown was on dynamic fracture mechanics of metals subjected to extreme rates of impact and has become a very frequently flight, a, a cited classic. Since then, he has moved on to many other areas, which include the investigation of dynamic damage evolution, dynamic shear banding, the fracture and fragmentation of very brittle solids, such as ceramics, ceramic composites, and polymer composites, and other heterogeneous materials and structures. <clears throat> In all of these areas, he has established himself as the undisputed leader. His most recent work on dynamic impact and shockwave physics of layered systems has also met with similar spectacular success. Now let me give the podium to Ravi to share the many ways he's practicing engineering with impact. So this evening, I'm going to describe impact and its applications in engineering. So impact, we all understand what impact means. So we always think of impact as collision between two objects. And when the collision occurs, and this is something which we intuitively understand, and the collision between two objects occurs over a very short period of time, and this is very important, and also very high force is applied. And this is a wave-dominated phenomenon, and I will describe to you what this wave-dominated phenomenon means. And the collisions can be elastic. That means if you look at this tennis ball, it impacts the floor, but it bounces back, it recovers its shape completely, and that means it's elastic, so they're recovering the deformations. But if you look at a car crash, for example, in this case, two cars colliding against each other, then there is inelastic deformation, or damage, which causes extensive damage in this case by the collision of these two cars. And we all know this sort of collision which happens in accidents. And so this is, uh, my wife told me I should apologize for this. But, but this is something which I thought you should hear because we always associate these collisions with, uh, with this sort of noise. And the results could be catastrophic. And this effect obviously depends on the mass, the acceleration, and also the relative velocity between the two bodies. And this could result in extensive damage and failure, as we know from, like, for example, this bullet hole damage in a glass. So if you look at the impact itself, this is nothing new. It has been happening for billions of years. For example, if you look at the origin of our moon, which happened about 4.5 billion years ago, when the Earth was in its nascent stage of formation. So there was a collision with a Mars-sized planet, and this collision resulted in debris, which eventually coalesced into the moon. That's the origin of the moon, which is uh, postulated by the giant impact hypothesis, and which is widely accepted now. But if you look farther away, if you look at Mars, for example, there are many, many impact craters, and some of them shown here. And the impact crater which I show here is the Gale Crater, the Gale Crater is where the Mars Science Laboratory has landed, the JPL uh, Curiosity mission. And now the Curiosity is making its way towards Mount Sharp, which is in the middle of the crater. And Mount Sharp is a direct result of this impact, which happened many years back. You, and the other impact event with the planetary science, which you may be familiar with, is the famous Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet impact, where the comet broke up into many pieces, and this impacted the Jupiter, which was observed for the first time of a planetary impact, and many of the probes uh, from JPL. And this is an ultraviolet image showing uh, the, the flume and the impact sites. And the flumes could be you know, many thousands of kilometers wide. 
Closer to home, this is the impact crater, meteor crater in Arizona, which the impact occurred about 50,000 years back. And this crater is about a mile wide and about a third of a mile deep. And this is a crater, a beautifully preserved crater, because it's in the desert. And this crater can be visited. So these are some of the things, which the craters, which have shaped our planets over the many, many years. But there was a very important event, and that is the reason we are here today in this auditorium. This event occurred about 65 million years ago. And while the dinosaurs roamed the Earth, there was an impact which occurred, which occurred in the Yucatan Peninsula, what is the present day Mexico, and in the Gulf of Mexico. So this impact was by an impactor which came from an asteroid, which was about 10 kilometer in size, that means it is the, the impactor is the size of Pasadena. And this is impacting the Earth at about 20 kilometers per second. So that is about 45,000 miles per hour. So there is no protection against such impact. So this impact created climate change, and that eventually caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, as originally had been proposed by Walter and Louis Alvarez at UC Berkeley. So this impact created these uh, changes and today, you can see this, uh, the, the crater is observed as observed from space, because this crater is hidden partly in the ocean, is about 180 kilometer diameter crater. And this caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. And in many ways, that's the reason we are, why we are here today. But coming back to Earth, so one can look at, for example, the impact which occurs uh, due to birds on aircraft. So you can see the, the British Airways flight here, which is surrounded by this geese which when the airplane takes off from the, from the airport, I mean, many times when they're cohabiting with, with these birds, so there could be a serious damage. And you can see the damage which has occurred here to this plane, the nose is completely destroyed. And in this case, the, the engine, the, the turbine blades are uh, destroyed. And this is the famous flight US Airways, which was uh, piloted by Sully Sullenberger, who managed to land this in the Hudson River. And in all these cases, the planes managed to land. But this could have devastating effect on what happens uh, to the structure itself. Another famous impact event has to do with this foam impact, which occurred on the Space Shuttle Columbia, which tragically resulted in the loss of the Space Shuttle. So this uh, shuttle, when it took off, the a foam piece, which was about the size of a big loaf of bread, impacted the Bing. Launch video seemed to implicate the foam strike near panel 8L as the cause of the breach. At the time of the Columbia accident, it was unknown whether or not a foam impact could break an RCC panel. To find out, NASA began ballistic impact tests while the RCC panel was still being investigated. NASA Glenn Ballistics impact researchers constructed a unique gas gun for small-scale ballistic testing of external tank foam impacting RCC. So the impact really created this hole in the wing, which eventually brought the shuttle down. When the shuttle entered, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, it burnt up because of this hole which was created in the RCC panel, the, the reinforced carbon-carbon wing, which was supposed to protect this against this uh, re-entry. Now, if you look at the space assets which we have, like the space station, these are com constantly bombarded by space debris, which could be either due to micrometeorites or the orbital debris created by us. So these debris are going at about 5 to 25 kilometers per second, really fantastic speeds. And you can see the debris cloud as was mapped. And so there is a lot of debris which is floating around. And indeed, they have found this sort of impacts in the space station. So this is from the Russian module or the Zarya section of the International Space Station. This was completely penetrated by this very high speed impact occurring from this debris. And the satellites also could be damaged from this sort of uh, impacts. And also in the space shuttle, the window, they found this sort of uh, impact crater, which happened due to this impact debris. So one needs to protect all these things against this sort of impacts. So here, this is a movie from the group of R.S. Rosakis, where this is simulating the hypervelocity impact which you see in space applications. For example, there is, a, there is a nylon cylinder which is impacting a thin aluminum plate, 
And as it impacts, it creates this debris cloud. And you can also see the shock waves, which are propagating from the impact point. And also, you can see some of the, the shock waves associated with the debris itself, which are moving into the thing. So this impact occurred about, about five kilometers per second. And this can create inter, intense damage in this kind of space structures. So you can see the simulations. One of the ways you try to understand such impacts is through numerical simulations. And these numerical simulations is a group of, from the group of Professor Michael Ortiz. And it was performed by uh, research scientist Bo Lee. And here you can see this uh, impact, which is occurring about 5.5 kilometers per second. And you can once again see the similar debris cloud. And from this, you one tries to understand the physics of the deformation. So in order for us to simulate these events, such events are design engineering structures, one needs to understand what are the material properties and the physics associated with this deformation. So for that, we need to understand some of the basic concepts. The basic concepts which one really tried to invoke here for understanding such impact problems are some basic principles I've listed here. The first one is the, what is the force? How can we calculate the force which arises from the impact? And that can be done using the Newton's second law. And that is basically saying the force is mass times acceleration. And this is a very simple equation. And this provides a very good estimate of what is the force acting on the structure due to impact. And it, it could be either in compression, as we see in the impact, in the initial stages of the impact, you have compressive forces. And you could also have tension when the, the waves reflect from the structure, from the boundary of structures. Then you could have tensile stresses which are acting, which will break apart the structure. So this causes two types of changes. One, it sets the body in motion and also deforms the material. And this deforming the material, there could be shape changes. And the shape change could be of two kinds. One could be the associated with the volume change. That means the material could become smaller under compression. And the other one, it could be the material could be sheared, and which will cause failure of these materials. So other idea is that the, the, when the body is in motion, there is the momentum. The momentum is ma just a mass times the velocity. And this momentum remains conserved. So one needs to disperse this momentum if you want to protect the structure. And one of the ways the momentum can be dispersed, uh, it can be mitigated, is through this dispersion idea. And we will discuss this dispersion a little bit later on. The most important quantity associated with the impacts, as we understand it, is the kinetic energy of the associated with, with the projectile or the impacting body. So that is 1 half of the mass times the square of the velocity, or mv square over 2. And this is, again, conserved in the collisions. But you can dissipate this energy through various mechanisms by, through the damage and failure by crumbling and breaking the material. Then one can mitigate this. So just let me walk you through what happens during impact on the waves, how this happens. So when an impact occurs on an object, then the waves propagate in the body, both in the impactor and the object which is being impacted. And these waves propagate at certain characteristic wave speeds, which is the property of the material. And in the process, what you do is you convert the kinetic energy into potential energy. So there is the partition of the energy from the kinetic energy into kinetic energy and the potential energy. And this potential energy is essentially going into deforming the body and also the, the projectile. So and one can see this uh, sort of waves, again, from the simulations. So here you see there's an impact which is occurring, the similar, same impact which I showed you before. But now we see the cross section. And you see these waves propagating into the body. And these waves propagate at a speed which is characteristic of the material properties. So we can understand that this sort of waves. There are two types of waves generally associated with uh, the propagation into the disturbances, propagation of disturbances into solids. And I'll show you a small video. In a longitudinal wave, the disturbance that makes up the wave is along the direction in which the wave travels. Longitudinal waves are also referred to as compression waves. In a transverse wave, the disturbance that makes up the wave is perpendicular to the direction in which the wave travels. So there are two types of uh, ideas you get from this uh, video. Is that one is the wave motion. That means 
how the wave is, uh, the disturbance is propagating along the structure that is given by the wave speed. That's the property of the material, in this case, the property of the spring, the stiffness of the spring, and so on. And the other one is the particle motion, how fast the spring is moving can be given by the particle velocity, and that is related to the loading amplitude. If I push this harder, that means the particle velocity will be higher, the motion is set in, uh, set in, the, in the motion of the spring will be higher. So typically the particle velocity is less than the wave speed because the disturbances are communicated through the wave speed which is propagating along this structure. So today we will be concerned about this sort of so-called pressure waves which is propagating longitudinally in the direction of the structure. So just to visualize these waves, once again I'm going to show you the type of waves which emanate from this sort of impacts. Once again we are looking at this hypervelocity impact where the projectile has small small nylon cylinder is impacting this candy glass. So this candy glass is the one which is used in Hollywood. When, when you see somebody going through a glass door or something like that, this is the material which is used, which is made of essentially sugar mock. And here the impact is going to occur at about 10,000 miles per hour, which is 4.4 kilometers per second. And this is being visualized using a high-speed camera, about 100 million frames per second. And you'll see what happens here. So the impact occurs, so this is shortly after impact, the cylinder is coming into the glass, and you can see some disturbances propagating out, outward, and you can see now the waves going from the hole where it's being impacted, and now the waves are propagating further, and these waves are propagating at a characteristic speed, and you can see further, these waves propagating further out, and eventually the waves reach the boundary of the plate, and they will begin to reflect from the boundary, and you start seeing the interactions of these waves and that with the, with the damage which is occurring. So these waves are coming back as tensile waves, causing extensive damage. So that gives you an idea of how the wave propagation nature of this uh, in, the, in the solid. Now, when you have very high amplitude impact, this would create shock waves in the material, and the shock waves are important, which are dynamic discontinuities of pressure and particle velocity which are propagating into the solid. And these disturbances propagate at a speed which is faster than the characteristic wave speed of the media, and that is a very important characteristic of this. And we are familiar with more with the shock waves in air or gases. So here the speed of sound in air is about 340 meter per second. When you exceed the speed of sound, then you, for example, in aircraft moving, faster than the speed of sound, that's the Mach number, which is the air speed divided by the sound speed, is greater than one, then you create this Mach, uh, Mach waves, and there is pressure discontinuities across these Mach waves, and the, a beautiful visualization of this uh, Mach waves, or the Mach cone, can be seen in this fighter jet when it exceeded the, the speed of sound because it was flying in moist air, the condensation of the air, you can see this cone, which is the Mach cone which you see here. Now, one, one has also this kind of shock waves in solids. This is a beautiful experiment which was performed by Veronica Eliasson when she was at Caltech. And here, the projectile is impacting a column of water which is in a wedge, and this is surrounded by a solid media, a polycarbonate plate. So when the projectile is moving through the air, it generated shock waves, a spherical shock wave in the air, because the projectile itself was moving faster than the speed of sound in the air. It is also, because of the, the high amplitude of the impact, it generated a shock wave in water also, so you can see the shock front which is propagating here. So in order to have the continuity of the stresses and particle velocities between the, the water here and the solid, you also generate this mock stem or the mock waves here in the solid. So you can see these shock waves in all three media, and we are going to focus on the shock waves which happens in the solid. So there is a notion of the time scale one has to contend with in dealing with the dynamic disturbances. So when you have an impact, so this impact is not going to last forever. So there is a finite time over which these forces act on the solid, and this has to do with the, the characteristic length which we are dealing with. So the characteristic length typically which we are dealing with in engineering structures could range from uh, the range of millimeters to hundreds of meters. 
So that is the maximum size of the structures, which we engineering structures, which we deal with. So when you deal with this kind of a structure, the characteristic wave speed in solids, at least in metals, it's about five kilometers per second, or about 11,000 miles per hour. So if you take some characteristic length here, say that of a car, for example, and divide by the wave speed, then you get the time, which is the characteristic time, which I have plotted the characteristic time corresponding to these structures. Typically, the characteristic time associated with all these things is in the range of microseconds. That means it's about one millionth of a second to about a millisecond. So that means it's about one thousandth of a second. So the entire event is, belongs to this kind of time scale. So when an impact occurs, like for in an accident, when two cars collide, the event of importance is occurring in the millisecond scale. So when you go to large set structures, like a ship or a plane, then you're talking about maybe perhaps a second. Second is, one second is a very, very long time. So typically we are focusing on a, a millionth of a second to a one thousandth of a second. For example, when, when you talked about the origin of the moon or when you have an earthquake, so we are dealing with very large structure here, the Earth. So in this case, if you use the characteristic wave speed, so the waves could be bouncing for hours because the structure is very large and the characteristic wave speed is pretty high, but the size is also fairly large. Now, how does this pressure develop in this uh, solid and what is happening during the impact? So let us focus on a small piece of material within the target which is being impacted. So when the impact occurs at certain velocity, the solid is being compressed. So in this case, we are thinking about a simple problem of one dimensional problem. So we can assume one dimensional strain because within the solid, when the solid is being impacted and the waves are propagating, the solid, the, the cube which we saw, is we cannot move in the lateral direction because of the very short time. So it is being confined by the surrounding material, and that causes this, uh, this sort of hydrodynamic pressure to develop. And this can be analyzed through the waves which are propagating in the solid. So there is a high amplitude wave which is propagating inside the solid with a characteristic wave speed, which is U sub S, which is the shock wave speed. There is the initial density, so behind the shock, the density changes because the size of the solid, which I showed you, the big cube has become a small cube. So the density has increased. And also, the, correspondingly, the specific volume has changed. So correspond, in order for us to have this very high, the change the volume, we need high pressure. And so there is a pressure jump across this. And these jumps can be calculated using the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, the so-called rankine hugonio relations. And the state of stress is hydrodynamic. So there, is a, there are two simple notions, uh, simple ideas which I want to introduce. One is associated with the volume change. So when the, when the shock wave is moving through the solid, it sets the solid behind the shock wave in motion, similar to when you have collisions. And that particle velocity is U sub P. And that is related to the amplitude of loading, how fast I'm impacting the solid. So that will correspond to this particle velocity. And one can calculate the volume change or the change in density through this very simple formula. That's the ratio of the particle velocity to the shock wave speed will give you the volume change. And similarly, the pressure is given by the product from the conservation of momentum. It is given by the product of the density, which we know very well. If we can measure the shock wave speed and the particle velocity, then we'll have the pressure. We will know the pressure. So that is the way you characterize the material. So the two quantities which are of interest are the shock wave speed, how fast the shock is moving, and what is the particle velocity, how the, uh, the mass is set in motion. So in a symmetric impact, I just want to point out that if you, the, the material, the impactor and the target are made of the same material, then the particle velocity which is set up here is simply the impact velocity divided by two. This is from the equipartition of the momentum. So the, now we need to have a pressure volume relationship, and that's what distinguishes different materials. So this pressure volume relationship for a solid at these high pressures is described as the Hugonio. And the Hugonio was a graduate of Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, in France. And here is this, the picture of the Hugonio when he was a student at Ecole Polytechnique in 1870. And he, here he looks disinterested in the whole thing. 
But later on, he came up with this brilliant idea of the conversion of the kinetic energy into the potential energy when you have the shocks. And he derived these relations for this pressure volume relationship. So this, the curve, when you, when you increase the pressure, essentially the volume becomes small. And this is a unique signature of the material. And this is what one is interested in most engineering applications. You want to know this relation. And this is similar to for an ideal gas, for example, the product of the pressure times the volume is a constant for an ideal gas, uh, what's called the Boyle's law. Now we are talking about pressure. What are the uh, the the pressure? What is the pressure we are talking about here during impact? So let us just for reference. So the pressure, the units of pressure, one can think of in the pressure in atmospheres. And at the sea level, the atmospheric pressure is about uh, it's one atmosphere. And as you, as you go to, into the ocean, in the deepest ocean, for example, it's about 1,000 atmospheres at the deepest part of the ocean in the Mariana Trench. If you go to the center of the Earth, it is about million atmospheres. And the, the kind of pressure which we would encounter in a car wreck when you have an accident, so the speed is about, say, let's say the collision is occurring, the two cars are impacting each other at 65 miles per hour. One can calculate using the simple formula which I showed you. It will tell you that it's about 7,000 atmospheres. So the deepest ocean, you have about 1,000 atmospheres. So the, in an accident, the pressure could be like around 7,000 atmospheres. So this is the reason you could have this, all this damage which could occur because you have strong forces acting against each other. Now, for example, if you look at the astrophysical applications in the center of the sun, it is about 10 power 11 atmospheres. And in the center of a neutrino star, it is 10 power 30 atmospheres. So these are really astronomical numbers which we cannot even contemplate. So those are very, very high pressures. But the engineering pressures which we will deal with are in the range of these uh, maybe 1,000 to a million atmospheres. Now, how do we? Uh, look at this uh, pressures and how can we measure the response. So in the range of applications which we want to think about, so for example, I already showed you in the car wreck, it's about, say, a million atmospheres. So if you have, for example, in the armor, if in a tank or in a body armor application, or in the case of a missile, so these things are impacting at, say, one to two kilometer per second, and the events are lasting about one millionth of a second. And if you go to even higher velocities, if you want to generate higher velocities, there is the so-called Sandia Z machine, which essentially creates a very large current and causing implosions. And in this case, one can generate up to 50 kilometers per second or 100,000 miles per hour. And this can generate pressures on the order of in the center of the core of the sun. And the idea of the Z machine is really to cause, create fusion in a lab. So they're working on fusion to create the conditions which prevail in the sun. So this is the range of pressures one is dealing with, but in engineering applications, as I uh, told you earlier, that we are dealing with in the range of a million to, say, 100 million atmospheres. So how do you create this sort of compression or the, in, the, in, the, in a laboratory? As I mentioned before, that the Z machine is the, creating some of the fastest velocities or the fastest impact of speeds in the world. It's a very large facility in the Sandia National Labs. One can create also impact, as one, one knows, using gas guns or propellant guns. And you can increase the stages of the gun, like a two-stage gun, three-stage gun, and so on. So these are the range of particle velocities one can create. So the, the kind of university atmosphere at Caltech, so we operate with this, say, the gas guns, propellant guns, and also there are two-stage guns which are available. <clears throat> so the range of velocities which can, we can create is in the one to two kilometer per second in my lab. So what are we doing in my lab is that we take a, a powder gun or a propellant gun in this case. This is a Navy gun which was refurbished from the Second World War and we fitted it with a breech, a powder breech. So we load this with propellant and ignite this using a cartridge and this generates high pressure propelling a projectile which impacts a target which is in the chamber which is highly instrumented. And this impact is occurring in the range of 400 to 2 kilometer, 400 meters to 2,000 meters per second. So we can go up to about 5,000 miles per hour. So what can we measure in the lab? So we can measure two things. 
So one is that we can measure the particle velocity. And the, for example, this duck is sitting on this wave. And if the duck is moving up and down as the wave is moving around, we can measure that. And as the wave is moving about, then we could measure the wave motion also. So we can measure, essentially, the wave speed and the particle velocity. So that gives you, as I mentioned earlier, that we can measure the volume change, and then we can also measure the pressure, because we are measuring the particle velocity and the wave speed. And how do we measure this? So we measure this using very simple ideas. So here we have an impactor, which is impacting, as I mentioned, between 1 and 2 kilometers per second on a target. The target is of interest, which we want to understand the material properties. So we use an electric shorting pin. That means when the impactor impacts this target, so there's a signal which is gener electrical signal which is generated. At the same time, we are measuring the rear surface motion because there is a wave propagating through the target. When the wave arrives here, we can measure using the velocity interferometry when the shock wave arrived. So when we know this, then the signal looks like this. So there is the wave which arrives. So we know the wave arrival time. And the shock, the material shocks up and reaches the so-called Hugonio state, which is the pressure which we are interested in. But we are also interested in the structure of the shock wave. And the duration, typical duration which we generate is for a microsecond. So we are creating this million atmospheric pressure for a microsecond, very, very short time. And we try to probe the material properties at this small scale. So we can measure the shockwave speed by dividing the distance by the time of arrival. So that is the shockwave speed. And we measure the particle velocity using the velocity interferometer, which is a wide angle Michelson interferometer, which we use for measuring during the short times. And what do we get? We get, as a function of the particle velocity, the particle velocity is a function of the impactor velocity. This shockwave speed is a property of the material which we measure. And it turns out that for most materials, that we have a linear relationship between the shockwave speed and the particle velocity, or the imposed motion. And this is the so-called equation of state, which can be used for calculating our pressures. So what have we done in my lab? Let me just describe two projects which we have done. One is to access the high pressure state. So we are interested in the high pressure state of the material, understand the material properties of the pressure volume relationship. And this work is, uh, was carried out by Justin Brown. And here, the idea is this. If you want to achieve very high pressures, you can increase the impact velocity. If you increase the impact velocity, you increase the particle velocity, and then you can achieve high pressures. But we are limited by the velocity, impact velocity of the facility which we have. And the impact velocity, in our case, is about 2 kilometers per second. Suppose we want to achieve pressures much higher than that in the lab. Justin Brown came up with this idea that you enclose the material of interest. In this case, we want to study the properties of copper. It is enclosed in a material where the shockwave speed is higher than that of the inner material. So what this does is, as this, when it's impacted, then the wave is a plain shockwave. But as it propagates, the outer material, the shockwave speed is higher than the inner material. So it moves ahead faster. But it cannot disassociate itself with the inner material because of the continuity. So it creates these shockwaves, the converging shockwaves, which co collides at the axis of the, of the inner material. Then as it expands, it creates the so-called mock stem. Again, similar to the mock waves, which we saw when an aircraft flies supersonically. And so this creates a high pressure region here. And this mock stem is propagating at the shockwave speed of the outer material. So artificially, I have increased the shockwave speed in the material, even though I have my impact velocity is limited. So this way, I can achieve higher pressures, even though my impact speed is limited. So this is the simple idea which Justin Brown used. And I'll show you the movie to show that, in fact, this thing occurs. So initially, we introduced the plane shock in the material. And then this collides. So you, now you create the mock stem, which propagates at the same speed as the outer material. So this way, we can create very high pressures at the center. So you can see the pressures which we should get are here in this range. But in the center region, we are getting high pressures. So we can amplify the pressure by using this technique, by this concentric cylinders. So we measure this now experimentally. 
So here we show that the velocity interferometer probes, which are the visor probes, which are used to measure the response at the back of the thing, back of the target. So this is the copper properties of copper which we are interested in. So we are impacting with aluminum at about 1.5 kilometer per second, and we measure the response at the back. And these are the probes which are shown, which are embedded here. And these events are measured over a very short period of time. As I mentioned, the whole event lasts about a microsecond or so. And here are the probes which are at the back of the copper cylinder and also in the aluminum outer cylinder. So this is the aluminum cylinder in the, in the outer cylinder. So here you see that it reaches this free surface velocity reaches the impact velocity of 1.5 kilometer per second. But if you look at the center of the uh, copper cylinder, where the mock stem or the high pressure region is, then you get about twice the free surface velocity. So you increase the particle velocity, and also you, the shock velocity is corresponding to that of the outer cylinder. So we get these two enhancement effects. So this way, we can enhance the pressure substantially. So we can also study the structure of the shock wave using the experimental device, which is called Orbis, which looks at the full, full profile at the back of the, back of the uh, target. And the, this is the simulation which I showed you earlier. So here is the mock stem, which is seen here. And these are the incident and the reflected shocks, which can be seen here, and also the shock in the outer material. So we, can, we have validated this technique for achieving high pressures. Now we can take this technique and use it in any range of velocities. In this case, we have showed it at about two kilometer per second, we can get an equivalent velocity of four kilometer per second. I'm making my gun look like it is shooting projectiles at four or five kilometer per second rather than at two kilometer per second. So, and that's what is shown here. So we can achieve, if I had a symmetric impact, a homogeneous targets, then this is the range of pressures I could explore. But now, because of this mock lens target, I can increase the stress significantly, and we can achieve, with this kind of simple idea, a volume compression of about 30%. So we can change the volume of a piece of copper by 30%, and it needs about a million atmospheres, but we do this only for one millionth of a second. So it is a very, very short amount of time we are probing the material response. Now, let me just uh, discuss the next topic, which is the impact protection and mitigation. How do you mitigate the impact threats? When, uh, for example, when a bullet is shot at a target or a projectile is impacting a plate, how do you prevent damage? So this is the idea of the bulletproof glass. As, this, as you will see that this the video, that nothing is 100% bulletproof glass, but it can stop the bullets, but it can start bulletproof. So this is a very interesting video. My name is Trent Kimball, President and CEO of Texas Armory Corporation. Today I will redefine what it means to stand behind my product. My name is Lawrence Casso. This is my AK-47, and today I get to shoot my boss. Don't try this at home. So you can see this is the idea of the bulletproof glass. The bulletproof glass is nothing but layered material. So they have clear layers of materials. One is glass, the other is some polymer. So they have a very stiff material and a soft material. So these are layered. And when the bullet impacts the plate, then the, the projectile is stopped because of the damage which occurs, because this material is more compliant and causes the material to deform. So we, we were interested in this sort of concept, but in, at a more fundamental level. So here we are going to look at one-dimensional impact of layered media. Once again, the similar idea to bulletproof glass, we have a soft layer and a hard layer. And so here we also measure the stresses inside the, this layered media using manganin gauges. And once again, we are measuring the particle velocity at the rear surface and also the shockwave speed arrival. This is the work of my student, former student, Shiming Zhuang. 
And in this case, we measure the stresses within the layers. So here, the stress is measured inside the layer during an impact. So the impact is happening at about 500 meter per second. So this is the stress. Here, you can see there is a finite rise time associated with the shock. There is a long rise time associated with the shock. And also, the shock is not flat anymore at the top, the Hugonio state, but it's oscillating. These oscillations are due to the fact that the waves, shock waves are reverberating back and forth within this media. This finite rise time is a very important uh, factor. That is an indicator of the dissipation of the material, how much energy the, the material can dissipate. And the fluctuations indicate dispersion. That means how the momentum is dispersed. So that way, you can mitigate the damage. So these two ideas are shown here. So now, this movie shows when you impact this target. So here, there are three things running together. So here, this is the hard material which is being impacted, a homogeneous hard material. This green is the soft material which is being impacted. These are the shocks which are propagating. So this shock is the speed, the wave speed is higher. This wave speed is slow, slower than the hard material. But you can see the composite or the layered media, it is propagating slower than either of the two speeds. So when it is propagating slower than the other two, that means the, the shock wave speed is smaller, which I mentioned to you earlier that the pressure is proportional to the shock wave speed. And so you can already lower the pressure. And also there are these oscillations which cause the dispersion of the momentum which you are importing to the structure. So this is one of the basic ideas behind so bulletproof glass, or if you want to create a very effective armor for dispersing momentum. So here we also examined what is the effect of the properties of the various layered media. So here we looked at different combinations of materials. For example, a, a soft material, which in this case is polycarbonate, and a very stiff material, which is glass. And we also looked at polycarbonate versus stainless steel, which is even stiffer. So here we look at one of the important quantities in shock physics, which is called the shock impedance, which is the product of the density times the shock wave speed, which is a material property. And so if the mismatch is much higher, so in the case between the polycarbonate and stainless steel, then you see a very long rise time. So what that tells you is that if you have very large impedance mismatch between the layers, then your rise time is higher, rise time is bigger, and the viscosity, that means the effective material viscosity is higher, so you can dissipate more energy. So the idea for in creating this kind of layered armor or bulletproof glass would be to increase this mismatch. At the same time, because the rise time is getting longer, then we are increasing the viscosity. And the viscosity, we can increase the viscosity by a two-fold increase in the effective viscosity exponent. So we can dissipate energy quite effectively using this sort of strategy. So let me finish off my talk by discussing some of the projects which is currently going on in my lab. So Mike Rawls is looking at extending this idea of this layered media in the one-dimensional layered media into particulate composites, because we want to make realistic engineering materials which for shock protection applications. So in this case, he's looking at similar shock experiments, but now in particulate composites. And this is very important if you look at civil structures like concrete and also granular media like sand and soil and so on, which are being impacted by missiles or projectiles. And in this case, you want to think about uh, particulate media. So he's, he's making composites, which are particulate composites. In this case, he's using a model composite again, using a plexiglass embedded with glass spheres, and it's being impacted by an aluminum impactor. And if you look at the microstructure of this material at a very small scale, so this is like half a millimeter, so you see the microstructure of this material. These are glass spheres embedded in the plexiglass. And the idea is to really to disperse this wave. As the wave is propagating through this such a microstructure, you can cause dispersion and dissipation of this um, shock through the material. And we are investigating the concepts. And Mike is working on this project. Another project which we are working on is related to looking at strength of materials and their role in instabilities. One of the, the projects, a very big project which is going on at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab is the inertial confinement fusion. So in the inertial confinement fusion, what you want to do is 
you want to take the fuel, which is the deuterium tritium mixture, and you want to compress this by a factor of 1,000. I showed you an example where we compress the material by about one third. But here, you want to compress the material by about 1,000 times. So this is very, very large compression which we are talking about. What you want to do is you want to create the conditions at the core of the sun. So you want to have abundant energy through fusion. So this is a very, very big idea. And in this case, what is the problem? So you are taking a capsule, which is about one millimeter in diameter, filled with this fuel, and you are compressing this by focusing lasers and generating x-rays in a hall room in this uh, metal cylinder. And you are focusing this energy onto the, onto the sphere, and you want to compress this by using the spherical converging shock waves. But when you do that, not everything happens perfectly. If it implodes symmetrically, then you can create this very, very high pressure. But what happens is that you develop instabilities, you develop the spikes, and these spikes don't allow the pressure to reach this very high pressures of this, at the core of the sun. Then you can't have fusion. So one of the ideas is that the capsule, if you increase the strength of this capsule, then somehow you can suppress these instabilities. But at the same time, when you are compressing it so fast, the equivalent impact velocity is about 300 kilometer per second. And when you do it at with such very high speeds, you want to know what is the strength of the material. You have to have the ability to measure the strength of the material at this very high pressure. So the, one of the ideas which, which was been proposed by the scientists at Lawrence Livermore National Labs is a very clever idea, is to put ripples on a metallic sample, which is the capsule material, and then look at the growth of the ripple subjected to the same laser loadings, but now sort of a planar loading, and then watch the growth of these ripples. And by watching the growth of the ripples, one can infer the strength of the material. So that is the idea. So these are the initial ripples. And after the laser experiment, this is the, the amplitude growth of the ripples. And by looking at the growth of the ripples on the side of the sample, one can correlate this growth to the strength. Again, we want to look at, that, look at this idea in our laboratory, in the laboratory scale. And Kristen John, she is working on this idea. What she is doing is making samples. These are very simple samples. This is made of jello. Okay. And again, she created these ripples. You can see the ripples here. Now, she impacts this using a projectile and then watches the growth of these ripples in, with high-speed photography. Again, the idea is to come up with the laboratory experiments to validate this kind of an idea where she is measuring the growth of these ripples and then you can infer the strength of this material from this kind of growth of ripples. Eventually, we would want to extend this idea to metallic materials and other materials of interest in this kind of fusion applications. So the last project which I want to describe, which is how, uh, going on in my lab, is by Vicky Stolia. She is measuring strength at high pressures, but using the idea of oblique shocks. So, so far I talked about compression waves or pressure waves where the material is being compressed in this one direction. But if you think of a projectile which is impacting at an inclination at a, on a target where the projectile is moving in the horizontal direction, but the target itself is inclined and the impactor is also inclined, then you generate both pressure and shear waves. And this is the oblique plate impact experiment. So Vicky is right now working on a very novel idea where she wants to create this oblique shock waves and the dispersion shear waves using normal impact. So here she is impacting a projectile at a normal to this target, and there is the wedge, which is the material of interest which you want to study, which is embedded in this target. And by imposing this shock, the shock wave, the incident shock, uh, because the interface is inclined, you develop both the transmitted shear wave and the transmitted shock, which corresponds to the high pressure. Then, if you can measure the response of this, both the longitudinal velocities and the shear velocities, you can obtain, characterize both the pressure and the shear response of this material. And this is something which she is working on. And this is a movie, which is a visualization of the numerical simulation uh, to show that this concept could be made to work. And right now, she is doing experiments to validate this concept. Let me just close by pointing out the engineering applications which I already discussed. 
I focus my attention mostly on this uh, sort of protective structures of crashworthiness of vehicles or foreign body impact and also in kind of vehicle armor. So these are applications are important in national defense and security applications. There is also a very large number of applications which I didn't touch upon, which have to do with creating novel engineered materials because you can impose the shock for a very short time, then you can create this very high temperatures and pressures which can cause, you can make new materials and these materials could be super hard materials or materials with multifunctional characteristics, magnetic and dielectrical properties or composites. And this technique can be also used for studying material properties as I mentioned. The ultimate idea here is also to protect structures through various mechanisms of damage and failure. Let me just acknowledge uh, my students and collaborators. This work, I have been very fortunate to have really outstanding students who have worked with me and who are currently working with me in the lab on many of the ideas. So one could have this uh, crazy ideas, but you need this great students really to go out and accomplish this. And so I've been very fortunate in that. I've been also very fortunate to have great collaborators, both experimental and also in analytical and numerical collaborators who have helped me understand many of these ideas and also have challenged me to think beyond what I have been working on. So finally, I would like to dedicate this talk to my uh, former colleague and uh, friend, uh, Tom Ahrens, uh, who was in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences here, and who was a pioneer and leader in the area of high pressure physics of geological materials and also in planetary impact thinking about these problems. And uh, he really opened my eyes to the kind of the impact, impact cratering problems. He took me on a very nice field trip to Meteor Crater, where I was really made to appreciate the magnitude of impacts which can occur and also how our future and also the past depends on it. Thank you very much.